I'd like to welcome everybody to the spring 2021 Southwest Oncology group meeting. If you can hear me, if you can people just uh, type yes into their chat would be great. Um, so my name is Christina Bueg. I'd like you again to welcome you to the um, the Jerry and Noburo Oishi Symposium for the SWOG uh, uh, spring meeting. Hopefully our next meeting will be in person. Just a brief rundown of our agenda today. I'm gonna make a few brief announcements followed by the SWOG Nursing Research Subcommittee who will update you on uh, some of the activities in their committee and the initiatives they have in SWOG followed by the Pharmaceutical Sciences Update Committee with several members of that committee who will give you an insight into the very important work um, that our pharmacists contribute, contribute to our SWOG protocols. Next slide, please. Um, most importantly, well, not most importantly, but very importantly, I'd like to point out that we have a new general email address that we very much encourage you to use. It's easy to remember, ORP, at swag.org, ORP stands for Oncology Research Professionals, and this will be an email that we're gonna keep open where everyone can send follow-up questions uh, from today about any of the sessions you had heard, and I will, and I and other members of our team will forward those questions out to the appropriate panelists uh, or to appropriate people in SWAG. We encourage you to use this from for today forward about any questions you have, not about protocol specific stuff. So don't call me and ask me about an eligibility question, but if you have questions about um, the way that we can promote or support you guys as oncology research associates and nurses and data managers. Next slide, please. Um, most importantly, I'd like to just acknowledge Dr. Oishi, who is was during his lifetime a very avid supporter of the work that we do in SWOG for cancer research. And even after his death in 2020, his family has continued to support us. And so we always honor him. If you'd like to support him and make a donation in his name to the Hope Foundation, I'm sure they'd be happy to uh, accept that. Next slide, please. Um, the ORP, Oncology Research Professionals, is a subcommittee of nurses, data managers, research coordinators who come together to help advise SWOG on um, what can be done within SWOG to support our role in terms of education, resources, tools. So we very much encourage you to contact us and we want to hear your voice because we all are ORP. Please go to the SWOG workbench, a CRA workbench, and there's an OR committee link in there if you'd like to get more involved. Next slide, please. So the new ORP webpage is on the SWAG committee or SWAG CRA workbench, and it'll tell you who um, the resources are uh, and the committee members. Um, uh, we sit on various subcommittees, uh, disease committees, as well as education committees. Um, and we encourage you, if you like to get involved and have your voice heard, this is the fabulous opportunity to do so. Next slide, please. Liaison opportunities. So there's an ORP liaison in each of the disease committees. I myself am a liaison for the leukemia committee. And this is my opportunity as well as your opportunity to tell the study chairs um, and the protocol coordinators what works in a protocol and how it can be improved or the insight that you might have about um, the details and instructions in those protocols. We have, we review the ORP manuals, we review the protocols before they go out. It's an excellent opportunity to do that. And we have quite a few opportunities for specific disease sites. Uh, next slide, please. So these are some of the current opportunities, uh, early therapeutics and rare cancers, cancer control and prevention, gastrointestinal and leukemia. Um, and so we're looking for help in those arenas. It takes about three hours a month tops. If that, we'll send you a copy of the protocol, how you ask for your input, and then um, that gets enacted into the protocol. Um, the uh, liaison committee chairs, Seal Prochowski and Sandy Annis, we call her um, Sandy Annis. Uh, she goes, her legal name is Alexandra, are listed there and we encourage you to call them up if you have, if you're interested in any of these openings. Next slide, please. Key reminders, um, the SMD contacts are listed on the, uh, the CRA workbench and the fall meeting, hopefully it'll be in person, we're not quite sure yet, but just in case, this, uh, the fall meeting in Chicago is October 13th to 16th. Next slide, please. 
the CRA workbench, a couple of things I want to highlight to you on the CRA newsletter, which is on the top right side. We normally go to the left side, but on the right side, this is the newsletter that comes out quarterly and has a lot of really good information um, and, and topics about our role. On the far left, if you're not getting the newsletter, there is a way to join the CRA mailing list and sign up for that newsletter. Next slide, please. Uh, here's a copy of the newsletter. It is distributed through CRI newsletter at crab.org. Um, and if there's information in there that you'd like to see disseminated, please email me at, um, uh, at ORP at swag.org and uh, we'll get that incorporated. Next slide, please. Funding opportunities. So for not so much for our virtual meetings, but for the uh, uh, travel meetings like in Chicago or normally this year we would uh, in, in spring or normally in San Francisco, there is some opportunities for funding support to travel to those meetings. And so the URL is there if your site would like to take advantage of that. Um, next slide, please. I'd like to acknowledge all the ORP executive committee members, their names listed here, who have just been pivotal in keeping these things going, especially in um, our new normal. COVID times, just trying to figure out how we can navigate all of all of our new challenges and keep some of the important work of SWAG going from the research nurse, research associate perspective. Next slide, please. A special thanks to all our wonderful speakers on the nursing research subcommittee, as well as all the pharmaceutical sciences subcommittee. And of course, Courtney Willie, who is always incredibly pivotal in uh, making sure our virtual meetings keep running. Next slide, please. All right, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce the nursing, the SWOG Nursing Research Subcommittee, uh, a few select members um, who will be talk to you today about their initiatives and what they are up to and their accomplishments. And with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jamie Myers. Thank you so much, Christine. And hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever it is in your time zone. Uh, we're really excited about getting to spend some time with you today and are very grateful to be a part of the OECD Symposium. So we wanted to say thank you to Christine and to the ORP leadership for the invitation. So let's go ahead and bring up our first polling slide. We wanted to kick things off by finding out a little bit about who's in the audience. So there's going to be two slides we're asking you to respond to. One is going to ask you what your practice setting is. And the slide following this is going to ask you what your role is within that setting. So while you're answering questions, I also wanted to say a special thank you to Courtney Willie, uh, because she has been so great in supporting us as we prepared our presentation for you today. And I also wanted to say a special thank you to the entire SWOG staff and all of you for continuing to do amazing work in spite of the fact that we've been in the middle of a pandemic, we've had pauses, we've shifted to a telehealth model. Um, life as we know it has been radically different. So kudos to everyone for continuing this important work. Our goals for this morning are to give you an overview of our group. As Christine said, we're the nursing research subcommittee. We sit within the ORP. We're going to talk about our mission, role, and function today. We're also going to highlight a sampling of how we're currently supporting SWOG studies. And then we're going to gather some feedback from you about how we can better serve you. So how are we doing on our polling questions, Matt? Can we share results? Hopefully we're not frozen. <laughs> Matt, I don't know if you're able to put those results up, but if you can't, we can go ahead and advance to the next slide. There are the results. Oh, beautiful. So I don't know if everyone can see them there on the right hand side of your screen, but we're heavily represented by NCOR and um, have a nice mixture of various different roles. So thank you all so much for attending today and we'll look forward to hearing from you um, a little bit later in the program. So let's go ahead and advance to the next slide. All right, so here's a snapshot of what our mission is. 
we recruit and support nurse scientists to conduct research within the clinical trials research network. We also support and work to increase the involvement of the advanced practice providers in CTRN studies. And then the third component of our mission is to provide support to nurses who will serve as nurse coordinators, specifically for studies that involve unfamiliar assessments and or behavioral interventions. So this would be site support, facilitation, and education. Our roles have evolved a little bit since inception in that our primary focus used to be providing support to nurses who were serving as patient reported outcome study co-chairs. But as those have become more familiar to us, it was suggested as by John Hirschman actually, that we shift our focus so that we could better support studies that involve things that were a little bit outside the ordinary. So let's go ahead and advance to the next slide. Now, I, I just want to set the stage that we really want this to be an interactive session. Now, that can be challenging when there are over 200 people attending, which I'm excited to see those numbers continuing to climb over, climb over there. But we would love your feedback. And so we want you to utilize that chat function, which will be live throughout our presentation. We are going to ask you at the end of our content to tell us what you think every study chair needs to know to develop a successful trial from your perspective. We're also going to ask you to help us identify what issues and barriers might exist at your sites to prevent advanced practice providers from clinical trial enrollment. And then the last thing we're going to ask you to provide feedback on is how can nurse coordinators best assist you? So you'll be able to put your dialogue in the chat. You'll also be able to use the raise your hand function, and then we can activate your microphone so we can actually hear your voice. So let's advance to the next slide. So I wanted to just begin by highlighting something very exciting that happened relatively recently. What you see here is a little bit of a synopsis of a new guideline that was disseminated by DCP last September. Specifically, uh, this guideline was in response to requests from the NCORS, as well as requests from our group to outline the necessary qualifications for nurses to serve as chairs and co-chairs of studies for DCP and DCCPS trials, but also to outline the role of advanced practice nurses as serving as local or site investigators and enrolling and consenting patients, and then being able to practice within the full scope of their licensure by the ability to prescribe and write orders for study drug. Now, this particular guideline is for DCP DCP and DCCPS trials, not for trials that involve an IND, but there are some uh, dialogue and conversations going on in that arena right now that we're excited about. So I wanted to mention a thank you to Krista Braun Inglis, whom you'll be hearing from a bit later because um, the component of this that involves advanced practice nurses, she's particularly passionate about. So we'll be hearing a little bit of that in a few minutes. And I also wanted to say a particular thank you to Marge Good who is a nurse consultant with NCI DCP. And she heard the cry and she was willing to take these requests internally within DCP and work very diligently to help this guideline uh, be developed and then disseminated. It lives on the NCOR portal and you should have a copy of it as a handout from today's meeting. And while I'm talking about Marge, I couldn't help but mention there at the bottom of this slide that she and other nurses within NCI had a recent very seminal publication that I would highly encourage you to take a look at where they described the restructuring effort for the clinical trials research networks and highlighted the critical aspects of the role of nurses in conducting research within cooperative groups. And so in addition to Marge, Kathleen Castro, Andrea Danikoff, Shanda Finnegan, Linda Pareko, and Diane St. Germain were all instrumental in getting that publication out for us. So kudos to all of you. So let's advance to the next slide. I'm going to turn the microphone over now to Krista Braun Inglis, who will give an overview of some of the studies where an advanced practice practitioner currently is serving as an enrolling investigator. Krista. Thanks so much, Jamie, and thanks to everybody to the, for the OEC um, 
symposium for allowing us to speak. I want to give a special shout out to the Oishi family as they are from Hawaii and Dr. Oishi as he was a pioneer and we greatly miss him. I also just wanted to recognize that another pioneer in nursing and in squad nursing leadership passed away in 2020 as well, uh, Dorothy Coleman. And many of you may have known Dorothy from past uh, nursing committee. So I just want to thank the Oishis and Dorothy for all your support over the years. And um, so I'm going to talk now about the role of the APP as an enrolling investigator in SWOG studies. Next slide. So as Jamie mentioned, per the NCI DCP and DCCPS guidelines, uh, masters prepared, doctoral prepared, and PhD prepared advanced practice providers are permitted to serve as local investigators to consent and enroll patients to the DCP and DCCPS funded NCOR trial. They need to be rostered as non-physician investigators in RCR and so that's a key. So it's not just any advanced practice provider at your institution, but they do need to be registered through um, RCR as non-physician investigators. We can prescribe and write orders on these trials, but it cannot be for an IND agent. So that's a caveat that you, you need to check on. And we we have attached the document, uh, you know, attached the document for the full guideline for your review. Next slide. We wanted to focus, um, I wanted just to focus on the SWOG studies that we are currently able to enroll in separate from an oncologist. So the S1714, which is a prospective observational cohort study to develop a predictive model of taxing induced peripheral neuropathy. Steph Smith is actually going to talk a lot about that in a few minutes, um, but we are able to enroll as advanced practice providers separately from the from the primary oncologist. We've actually taken this on in our NCORP as an advanced practice provider led study. And I think in our NCORP over 85% of enrolled are enrolled under advanced practice providers for this study. Um, the next study I wanted to highlight is S1820, which is Dr. Virginia, Virginia Sun's study, who she's Dr. Sun's going to be talking in a minute. And this is uh, the randomized trial for altering intake and managing symptoms intervention for bowel dysfunction and rectal cancer survivors. This is a great study for advanced practice providers to enroll to as it, it's in within the survivorship realm. And we know a lot of advanced practice providers do practice in, in survivorship clinics and they also see a lot of patients in follow up. Next, next, next stop slide, please. Um, S1703, this is a little bit different of a, a SWOG trial. I think this would be more, I mean, advanced practice providers are able to enroll separately from an oncologist, but since this is monitoring um, overall survival in patients with serum tumor marker directed disease versus usual care in patients with metastatic hormone receptor positive breast cancer, this does go along with treatment. So this probably is not something that an advanced practice provider would independently manage, but she would met, but he or she may manage with a primary oncologist. And I see they could enroll in this trial, for instance, if the primary oncologist was not registered as an investigator, but they still wanted to participate. And then finally, SWOG 1904, which is a cluster randomized control trial of patient and provider decision support to increase chemo prevention informed choice among women with ADH and LCIS. This is a recent trial that opened. It is in high risk breast. It is a trial for high risk breast clinics. A lot of advanced practice providers do uh, practice in high risk breast clinics. So it's a perfect platform. And this is another um, trial where we are having a bit led by advanced practice providers in our end core. Um, next slide. So just to highlight, if you are thinking about, you know, engaging your advanced practice providers more at your site and having asking them to enroll or encouraging them to enroll, you, there are some barriers that we have found out by piloting this. Um, there may be protocol language that doesn't allow you to, to enroll despite the guideline. Um, we've also had issues with registering in CTSU, and that's because some of us have been involved with cooperative groups for a long time prior to there being this non-physician investigator uh, title. And um, 
So it's sometimes we're still we're still re rostered as an associate plus or something else. So you need to sometimes change um, our category within CTSU to allow us to enroll. We also wanted to um, just explain again the IND medications. For example, SWOG. 0820, the PACES trial, it is a trial that comes through DCP, but since there is an IND, IND on one of the medications, that wouldn't be a trial that we would be able to enroll in. Finally, just wanted to call out uh, that recently NCI uh, CTEP did a survey that was dis disseminated to LAPS and CORS and ENCTN sites, and they were assessing what degree advanced practice providers are involved in NCN and non NCN NCI trials. And hopefully we're gonna get those results soon and we'll be able to even expand our role more. So thank you. Um, I think that's it for me. I hope I kept within my time. <laughs> and I can take questions at the end. So I think we're gonna go on now. I talk about the support of recent and ongoing to be approved studies by our group. Let's go ahead and advance to the next slide. And Virginia, you're up. Great, thank you so much, Jamie, and thank you for the opportunity to share um, some of the protocols that are um, ongoing and soon to be hopefully <laughs> um, activated um, that we are working on. I do want to just acknowledge that we have many nurse scientists in our in our subcommittee that are developing the play the role of a study chair in our developing concept. So I'm certainly not the only one. And um, we have, you know, just a great group and, and many um, nurse scientists with interest of developing and serving as um, concepts and um, conducting trials and serving as um, study chairs within our network. Next slide, please. So I will be just going be giving a quick overview on two um, one trial and one concept because that one is not officially um, really a protocol yet even. But um, we wanted to start with S1820. Um, this is as um, Krista had mentioned our preliminary efficacy randomized trial of what we fondly call the altering intake managing symptoms intervention. So AIMS RC, the RC stands for rectal cancer. And um, this is a randomized design comparing um, the intervention to a healthy living education control. So this is a, an NCORP trial, you know, sitting in the um, cancer prevention and control um, arena and um, with a focus on really improving symptoms and quality of life. So this is our study schema. Just a quick overview of our study design. Um, starting with the gray box, we are focusing on rectal cancer survivors. Our target um, population is 94, um, sample size 47 per arm. And um, we are really truly focusing on survivors who are post-treatment. So between six to 24 months post-treatment completion, we are enrolling both survivors with a permanent ostomy or an anastomosis. And this is based on our preliminary um, work that led to the design and development of this intervention. And this will inform sort of the next phase. I'm um, sure we see some benefits in this preliminary trial and on, um, you know, the best population to to be um, selecting for for future trials. And for those who are um, for our anastomosis survivors, they we will also be assessing their low anterior resection syndrome score or LAR score. And um, of a, if they have a score of 21 to 42, which um, really means minor to major bowel symptoms, or um, then they will um, be eligible for the study. We are focusing with for, on English speaking um, participants for this trial with the hopes of thinking about including other populations and other diverse communities um, in, in future um, iterations of this intervention, adults 18 years and older. And so I also just want to um, thank everyone who um, who's at a site that participates on this trial and um, and your and your help with enrolling on the on the study. So once a participant is um, enrolled, they will complete baseline surveys and then we have designed a about 14 to 21 day run in period, which is a common um, design in behavioral interventions. And it really gives um, allows the participant to have a flavor, if you will, of of what um, 
the, the sort of different activities that we are asking them to participate in as part of the study. And so they will be doing a 24 hour dietary recall food and symptom diary, which is a very important piece of our intervention. And then um, also be able to give that information back to um, our um, health coaches in our um, sites um, site coordinators in the University of Arizona. We kept the definition very broad. So at, to date, the majority of our participants who are registered um, have been able to complete the run-in period and be able to register to step two and then be randomized. So after they complete the run-in period, they will be registered and randomized um, to either the intervention arm or the attention control arm. So AIMS RC is a 10 telephone coaching call intervention. We made it telephone coaching calls because it makes it nice and easy for us to be able to deliver this intervention, you know, regardless of ge geographic location. And um, the intervention is centrally administered by trained health coaches that are based at the University of Arizona. So, and this approach also allows us from a scientific perspective to be able to make sure that we are delivering the intervention as intended. So um, we work very closely to monitor, um, you know, the sessions and listen in on the sessions and check in on what's called intervention fidelity. So this approach really helps make it easy for, um, for, for sites to enroll participants and participate in the intervention or, or you know, both of these arms, but also scientifically help us um, make it easier for us to make sure that the intervention is delivered properly. So participants in the um, AIMS RC arm will receive a 10 telephone call over a four month period. It's, it lasts about 20 to 40 minutes per call. It re it's really driven by the um, participant and what their needs are. It's very personalized based on um, their bowel symptoms, what kind of foods are um, troublesome for them. And we do a lot of upfront assessments to make it personalized because we know um, symptom characteristics vary tremendously, preferences and tolerance with food varies tremendously as well. And so during these calls, we're really coaching them to appropriately modify their diet to manage their symptoms. And so, we don't just tell them, hey, if vegetables are bad for you, giving you really bad symptoms, stop eating them. Because we know healthy, healthy diet is very important for this population too. We actually work with them and teach them, you know, coach them on tips. So for example, if it's broccoli is giving you um, symptoms, you know, let's try cutting them up into smaller pieces. Raw vegetal, vegetables are probably gonna be a little bit challenging to tolerate for um, most of our, participants, um, maybe steam it, cook it a little bit. And then if there are, and then introduce other um, food types within the same category that are healthy. And so we do have healthy living, post-treatment, healthy living, healthy diet um, sort of guidelines in mind. So we give them these tools and um, these um, skills to really be able to modify appropriately so they can have their symptoms managed, but also be able to still eat a healthy diet. In between the phone calls, we'll be giving them text and email messages for support in relation to um, the skills um, in terms of diet modification that we have provided to them. They will also receive a resource manual. So then the attention control arm is our design for the control group. And this is um, where um, our participants will receive 10 telephone calls still, the same sort of number of calls and same time frame but the content is focused on 10 healthy living education topics that we had um, selected that, that are helpful for post-treatment survivorship. But these, this content does not include um, really the dietary modification that we are providing through the AIMS RC arm. And they will also get a manual and they will get standard text email messages support between the calls. We follow them at week 18 and week 26 with primarily patient reported outcomes. Our primary outcome is looking at bowel function. So this is really symptom management focused. Um, we're using the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center Bowel Function Index. We have a host of secondary outcomes, which includes quality of life. Um, we're gonna look at LAR scores, some of the constructs that are common to the coaching model that we're using, self-efficacy, motivation, um, affect. We're gonna be able to look at diet quality through the 20 hour dietary recalls. And then of course, see looking at feasibility, retention and acceptability. We've been activated for, um, for a little bit of time now. We were activated on December 9th, 2019. 
we um, really, I, I thank all the sites that have activated this trial and again, appreciate all of your help with enrolling um, to this study. We do have a monthly site coordinator call that we have found very helpful. Um, that happens every third Thursday of the month. And I, right now I want to give really a shout out to Krista. Krista really helps leads these site coordinator calls and really help me and work with me and in our SWOG team in terms of answering questions related to the study. And, um, and she is also the um, site um, PI for the NCORP in, in Hawaii. So she is really modeling, you know, what, what we're really trying to, to sort of elevate here in terms of being able to have APP service site MPIs um, on trials. And this study does, you know, and so non-physician investigators that are ros rostered, as Krista had said, can enroll to this um, study. And we welcome that. Um, we, we love to have APPs participate. And um, if you have any APPs that are interested, please feel free to reach out to Krista and I. We're happy to engage them and talk to them and help them through the process. Next slide, please. And this is just, I want to acknowledge, you know, it takes a village and I, we won't be able to do anything with every, everybody on this, um, uh, on this um, slide in terms of our key study personnel. We do meet every week with most of the, um, our key study personnel here listed here, and I just appreciate all of their support. And um, here's my contact information. If, any, if anyone has any um, questions or interests, we're happy to talk to APPs at your site or, you know, just, you know, happy to hear any thoughts or comments from you. And please join us on our Thursday site coordinator calls as well, if you're interested in that. Um, next slide, please. I just have a few more slides here to talk, um, to share with you some updates on another um, concept, because it's not quite at the protocol level yet, which is S2016. And this is a randomized phase three trial that's led by Dr. Vincent Chung, who is a medical oncologist at City of Hope. And I am one of the co-chairs. Um, this is a another protocol under the Palliative End of Life Care Committee. And Dr. Marie Brachitis is the um, committee co-chair that, that helps, um, that leads this project along with us. And so, what we're trying to test here is, is a primary palliative care intervention for pancreatic cancer patients and their family caregivers. And the definition of care is, 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 what, is what is nationally accepted, is, is a clinician who doesn't have um, a palliative care certification, you know, certified as a palliative care specialist. So this is a um, sort of the new area in terms of palliative care is, is the under the notion that all clinicians taking care of cancer patients should have some basic knowledge in relation to the key concepts of palliative care, such as symptom management, you know, goal setting, goal discussions, and all the important um, components of palliative care. And so we are in the gray box here, focusing on um, patients with metastatic pancreatic cancer and their family caregivers. Um, patients will still be able to participate in the study without a family caregiver, but we are, we would like to, you know, in the future enroll as many family caregivers as possible so we can understand their needs as well. The um, randomization is to two arms, an intervention arm and an attention control arm. Again, similar design to uh, 20, um, to the other trial. And so this is still centrally administered by trained APRN. So these are nurse practitioners who are not palliative care specialist certified, but have oncology experience, of course, because this is the population that we're working with. And the intervention is a 12 telephone session um, intervention over a three month period, six for patients. We do have sessions particular, specifically for caregivers as well. They will get resource manual and um, um, the patients, the participants can get palliative care consultations at their site if it's available upon request. We will document that. And um, at the end of the intervention, we will also be putting together a palliative care plan that's um, organized by the quality of life domains, so physical, psychological, social, spiritual, and be able to securely provide this information to the site um, team, to the oncologist and the oncology team so that they are aware of you know, the discussions and the things in all of these quality of life domains that we had discussed with our participants. Attention control is um, going to be using NCI booklet 
and still 12 telephone sessions over three months. And we're going to be collecting data three months and six months follow up. Next slide. So this is our key um, personnel right now. We are seeking funding. And we had just submitted another large grant to the NCI recently with the hopes that um, we will be able to secure funding and be able to begin protocol development. So um, stay tuned and we'll let you know, hopefully in the near future, about uh, more updates on SA 2016. Next slide. And now I will um, pass, pass the mic back to Krista and Stephanie. Okay, um, I think I'm first. Uh, next slide. Just real quickly, um, Dr. Sun already went over a lot of the things I do, um, but I am uh, fortunate enough to be her nurse coordinator on S1820. We work with a great team. I want to give a shout out to, I think Katie's on the, on the webinar today and Roxanne as well. Um, there's so many great people from University of Arizona that we work with too. Um, we have a wonderful team and I think that's what is led by Dr. Sun, which, which leads to the success has led to the sex, the sex, success of this protocol. Um, but what I've done as a nurse coordinator is I help to develop the protocol training. As Dr. Sun mentioned, I do lead the monthly site coordinator calls, but I can't do it without the whole team. A lot of times I actually ask them for input during, during the site coordinator call. Um, I really serve as a point person for a lot of the clinical related questions when Dr. Sun is not available, but we all again work as a team to do that and just being involved early on in protocol development, which helps to make this key. And I think Christine had even talked about how, um, you know, other other coordinators are so important as working early on in protocol development to give their input uh, for study. So, um, yeah. SA220 is a great study. I'm happy to be part of it. And I just nurse coordinator role is super important. I'll turn it over to Steph. Thanks. Um, I am Stephanie. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, all right, thank you, um, Krista. As, um, as previously mentioned, uh, my name is Stephanie Smith. Um, I'm a nurse with the Georgia NCOR. Um, my role as a nurse coordinator is somewhat unique, um, and it's, it's unique also in regards to nursing involvement with SWOG studies. Uh, I am the nurse coordinator, the clinical nurse coordinator for 1714. So chances are, if you have the study open at your institution, then we've probably met virtually. Um, so just a quick overview of S1714. This is a prospective observational cohort study to develop a predictive model of taxane-induced peripheral neuropathy in cancer patients. The study chairs are Magna Trivedi and Don Hirschman. Uh, despite COVID, enrollment has been going very well. It's a very easy to accrue to trial. Uh, this slide uh, was prepared about a month ago in preparation for the SWOG conferences, and it's already a bit outdated as uh, the accrual is now at 81%. So, but despite this, we are still providing training and sending site, site supplies. So if you're interested in opening this study, there's still time. There was also a recent modification to add the FACT NTX4 to several time points, and this was to harmonize with EAZ171 for patients that may be co-enrolled to those protocols, um, and also provided some clarity in the protocol. Now, follow-up rates with patients accrued to the study have been very good. Uh, we are encouraging sites to try to recruit non-small cell lung cancer patients. There's the approved regimen list in the protocol, and the regimen for non-small cell lung cancer isn't a um, super common one anymore with advances in non-small cell lung cancer treatments, but there might still be some of those patients out there. So please try to recruit those patients if you're able, as we pretty much have a predominantly female uh, accrued study here. Um, this study does have translational study work plans, so please know that there are biospecimen collections at various time points on this protocol. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so the neuro assessments and the neurosensory testing, and this is where I really come in. The study assessment, some of the study assessments required with this protocol include the neurosensory testing with the neuro pen and the 128 hertz tuning fork. The neurosensory testing will be done um, at various time points 
um, as you noticed on the scheme up on the slide prior. Uh, physicians, advanced practice providers, and nurses are the only clinicians who can perform the neurosensory testing in this protocol. Um, the way it works is you first watch some training videos that are available on the SWOG website and linked through CTSU. Um, and then the clinicians are observed demonstrating proficiency using these tools. Um, the original plan in this protocol included an option of being observed in an in-person SWOG meeting, but of course COVID has impacted our ability to have those in-person meetings over the last year. So the only option for this last year has been the uh, virtual um, video conferencing observation through Zoom. Um, they don't take very long to complete. They average about 10 to 15 minutes, but we schedule a 30-minute observation. Uh, there are, if there are multiple clinicians being observed in one call, then we can schedule enough time to observe everyone. When I, when I get emails from sites about scheduling, um, I, I request that you send me a few dates and times, including your time zone that you are available, because you also have to coordinate with a test patient. Um, I just have to coordinate with myself. So it's best if you send me your availability or a few dates that you and your test patient are available, or if there's multiple clinicians at your site that want to get observed in one call, then try to get everybody's availability. And then we can do it all in one, or, and I'm happy to do more than one also, um, but some sites like to knock that out all in one. All right, next slide. So this slide summarizes just the observations that I've completed over Zoom. Um, and this was completed about a month ago. So these are uh, what I like to call my little fun facts with this study. Um, so at the time I gathered these stats, I'd completed 114 individual Zoom observations since June of 2019. Most Zoom observations included at least two clinicians that range from one to five. A single Zoom observation could have one nurse affiliated with five individual sites, which is most common with some of the NCORs that have rural clinics that the nurses travel to. Um, I've also had instances where I've observed five nurses within one single site, so it just varies. Uh, the NCOR with the most sites in one observation is Metro Men, um, where they had 13 individual CTEP sites that they were um, being observed for. Um, Minnesota is also the state with the most sites approved. Uh, I was averaging about seven observations a month in early 2020. Um, after COVID, May 2020, I only had two observations in the whole month, uh, likely due to furloughs and just general pandemic-related decreases in research activities. But we picked back up in June of 2020 with 14 observations in a month. Um, to date, so most recently, I have observed over 200 clinicians from 28 states and four, four Latin American countries, representing 123 individual sites, including LAPS, NCOR, main member, and international sites. Most of the clinicians are from NCOR sites, so shout out to the NCORs, um, uh, where RN and advanced practice provider involvement is most notable. All right, next slide, please. Okay, and this is where I believe we are getting into our feedback from all of you. Um, we're gonna be transitioning into uh, having a poll question, so we want to hear everyone's feedback, please. And at the completion of the polling, we'll also dis we'll discuss the responses, but we'll also have time for our general Q&A. So please enter any questions or comments you have into the chat. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and this is where we want you writing in our chat. What should every study chair know to develop a successful trial? Must do's and must not. So we'll take some time to allow. While we're waiting on some folks to respond, there have been a couple questions come through. We want to make sure and get to um, Stephanie. One person wanted to know how they could get more neurotips and monofilaments for 1714. And one person was asking if we were aware of the URCC enable protocol that recently opened. And there was a question also about if MDs that have palliative care certification can participate in 2016. So there's a few questions that we can address along the way as well. Um, sure, I can answer the question about the neuro tips. You can just email um, the S17, S1714 at swab.org email address and just indicate where you need those supplies sent to and we can ship them out to you. 
And one other little note, uh, people are respond in the chat, please do select to everyone so we can all see the answers. Otherwise, they just go to the host. So um, in your drop down box, choose everyone so everyone can benefit from your comments. Virginia, would you like to answer the question as far as whether MDs that have their palliative care certification may participate in F2016? Um, yeah, sure. That's a great question. I think yes, and, and I know there are other questions here about the ENABLE um, trial. We, we are very much aware of the ENABLE trial and um, our intent is it when SA 2016 opens, we will make sure that we we will not include, you know, the sites that are participating in the enabled trial because then there will be overlap. But um, so as Dr. Marie Bakaitis um, is very much involved in this concept, so we we have arranged it such that there will be no over, no overlap just for scientific reasons. Um, and absolutely, I think with the with MDs with palliative care um, certifications are definitely, I think, you know, can participate in terms of enrolling patients. Um, we will document, obviously, whether there are palliative care um, services already available at the sites um, and, and be able to share, you know, care plans and information um, between the sites. We do have experience with doing secure communication, you know, with our, um, a, you know, with our interventionist, if you will, and um, sites, because we, you know, these kind of systems need to be built in just in case we hear something from participants, you know, in the um, sessions that the, the clinical team needs to be aware of. So we're going to leverage a lot of our lessons learned from the rectal cancer trial to, to build these um, communication channels. Virginia, this is Krista. I think it's important to um, maybe clarify that the Enable program is using um, clinic nurses and clinic advanced practice nurses for to deliver the yes. intervention. And your trial, your concept is more aligned with the S1820 type of intervention, correct? Right. Yeah. Because yeah. um, I think that one is a cancer care delivery, you know, research. So more like really implementing. Yeah interventions within participating sites and they're they they have a limit in terms of the number of sites that i think they can participate to whereas for us we're really still at the efficacy level um just you know with with our sort of centralized approach and really trying to understand whether um, the intervention um, makes it is beneficial and you know something like what the enable trial is doing could be the next step but but we're, we 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 are aware of it and we're going to have very clear um, plan in terms of um, no overlap between these two studies when the time comes. All right. Thanks so much, Virginia. Um, keep those responses coming uh, regarding study chair must and must not. Uh, we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay. Here's the polling question. Um, we would like to know what issues and barriers exist at your site that prevent APPs from clinical trial enrollment. You may select all that apply. And you will have a minute to answer this question. If you have another, you might uh, want to go ahead and free text that in our chat. While we're waiting for that polling to finish up, we can go ahead and review some of the responses coming in. Um, 
from Katie Arnold. We have uh, a successful study chair listens to the voice and the experience in his or her study team and acts on it. Thank you, Katie. From Susan Tuttle, um, she recommends to know what is feasible in the community setting. That is so true. A lot of our patients do come from the community. Okay. So our time is up on our polling question. Um, it does look like um, the main barrier is ordering study drug, followed by enrolling participants and then serving as local PI. We have some others. We had 10 other responses. So if you can enter your other in the chat so we can review that. We will be able to review these, res these responses even after um, our, our portion of this presentation is over. All right, next slide, please. And one more question for you to type into the chat for us is, how can the nurse coordinators best assist you? So feel free to re respond right there in the chat for us. Steph, I think there's one other response about the must-dos and must-don'ts that went to the host, if you wanted to read that out. So. Okay. Or I could, if you, if you. Have Pat, I'm seeing most of the to the panelists. I was trying to pick out the one to the host. <laughs> it was, um, it was a comment about it's really important to make clear due dates and time frames for study related assessment. It's a great point. Right, a couple, a couple more responses. Must do's make clinical tri make trials clinically useful in community settings. How is this going to impact patient care as well as science? Thank you, Samantha. Uh, regarding our APP question, APP is not given time by administration to participate in trials, complete training, et cetera. Yeah, we definitely have recognized that as a barrier. <laughs> Um, Gabriella, the main issue for international sites are customs. That's for the shipping of supplies, I believe, correct, Gabriella? I believe you had an issue with getting your supplies for 1714 because of customs. Issues that we don't always think about or realize here in the state. Okay, uh, Roxanne had um, some um, comments and questions. With both S1714 and S1820 requiring site staff to complete additional study-specific training before they can participate, would you both discuss if you found this requirement a barrier to site participation or if sites are happy to comply? Do you think other studies would benefit from including required training component? Um, I would say initially um, when 1714 was first ramping up, um, we did wonder if there would be some issues with site staff being able to um, complete the assessments and if it would be an accrual barrier, but we really haven't found that to be so. Some of the smaller sites that don't have um, nurses, research nurses on staff, and they have um, non-licensed CRAs, um, the physicians have been the ones to do the training and, and observation. Um, and have been accruing patients and their CRAs are able to help record those assessments, enter the data, and also can do the timed up and go. Um, please note the timed up and go requirement um, is um, that can be done by a non-licensed healthcare provider or CRA at the institution. Um, second part of that question, do I think that other studies would benefit from including a required training component? Um, I would say yes depending on what that um, study entailed, if it had a special um, assessment or something that's uncommon and unfamiliar, just so that it's being done the same across all institutions. Steph, and um, just to give a shout Sorry. out to the AP APPs at our site, we have CRAs too, as for a smaller site and don't have regular research nursing staff that 
we've actually used the APPs to do the assessment within the clinic visit. So. Yes, thank you so much for pointing that out. That is so true. Yeah, I guess for 1820, um, we had the same, you know, same thoughts that Stephanie just mentioned, you know, will will this be a barrier? Um, so what we did was we really thought about, and Chris, if you have any thoughts, feel free to chime in too. We really made the training as straightforward as possible. We worked really hard with the SWAG team to develop a training that's um, that won't take a very long time, but will still capture sort of the key um, information that um, that we 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 think sites would would need, and made it um, sort of a webinar, if you will, such that. Um, everybody can can go through it on their own time to have some flexibility there. We do have a brief um, post test um, as part of the training, but we also worked really hard to make sure that the post test is straightforward and focusing on the important pieces um, for sites to know. And um, so I, I do believe the training, if there are special um, components that are a little bit out of the ordinary um, would be beneficial. But I think one thing that I learned as a study chair that is even more important to have regular engagement with site coordinators and, and be, list, be able to listen to, as Katie mentioned, not just the team, but you know our, our participating sites as well and sort of the challenges. And we have been able to use that to, um, to put in some revisions to the protocol to make it more straight, more clear, clarify things, and, and really listen to the site um, coordinator's feedback. You know, and we were able to do this without sort of making major changes to the science, of course. It's really just clarifications and listening. So I really, the big thing that I learned is, you know, yes, listen to the team, but also regular engagement with sites and, and learn from the sites. So I'm going to chime back in here, you guys, because it's almost two o'clock and we don't want to overstay our welcome. Can we advance two more slides, please? For those of you who we piqued your interest, we would love to have you join our group. Uh, I've listed some information here on this slide. Typically, we meet the on Tuesday when we're meeting in person for SWOG. It's been a little more fluid when we've met virtually. We actually met on Monday this week. So um, if you'd like to be added to our distribution list, attend our meetings, get a copy of the minutes, just shoot me an email. And if you'd like to become an official member, there's a process for that. There's actually an ORP application we'd have you fill out and send back to the ORP membership committee with your CV. So uh, thank you guys so much for your wonderful comments. We'll, we'll get to capture these in writing so we can review them later. And as Christine and, um, and uh, Stephanie both mentioned, please use that general email as well if you have questions that we didn't get to today. But for now, we'll just say thank you and turn the mic back over so that the next group has their full time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Myers. Uh, thank you for the entire Nursing Research Committee. I, I want to point out to everyone who's listening, um, the slides from today, all of today's sessions are usually, oh, they will be posted on the group meeting website after the conclusion of the meeting. Um, after all the presenters have, you know, made their changes or whatnot, they'll be posted after after there. So in a week or two, you'll be to download that information. If um, and if anyone had any other questions, please put it in the chat, and I can get to those um, if there's anything I can answer. Um, and without further ado, I like to switch a little bit of gears here and introduce the Pharmaceutical Sciences Committee. You've done a tremendous amount of work in really streamlining and enhancing the treatment studies that we do and the information that we needed our fingertips to carry those out. Without Dr. Without any um, any hesitation, I'd like to introduce Dr. Su Fun Wong, who is the chair of the SWAG Pharmaceutical Science Committee. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, on behalf of the uh, SWAL Pharmaceutical Science Committee, I'd like to thank the OLP uh, for inviting us uh, to join in the symposium presentation today. Um, so there are a few things that um, a few of our members are going to share uh, also. So I'd like to start with the first one, which is uh, in the last few months, we have been doing a lot of standardization of um, section three and seven in uh, SWAG protocol development. Next slide, please. 
So, of course, when we do that, we always wonder why we're doing that, why we're making the change. Uh, part of the reason is because as in the process of reviewing uh, protocols, et cetera, uh, we recognize that uh, there's a lot of redundancy in protocol uh, with information presentation. So, our goal is to streamline the protocol, optimize the length of the protocol, try to avoid duplication because oftentimes duplication of information uh, may create uh, contradicting information and it's very uh, confusing uh, for site investigators also. So that is, uh, those are the rationale behind uh, why we do that so that it will be allow easy identification of information and uh, locations of the information and also to allow the improved utility of the protocol information and decrease confusion. Next slide, please. So I will start with uh, just giving you a quick uh, outline of what we have done with Section 3 drug information. Uh, this is has to do with the study drug uh, involved in the protocol. And so, of course, it's oftentimes a combination. It can be a non-FDA approved agents or it can be FDA approved agents. So essentially, we divided the categories of this study drugs into three areas. Non-FDA approved drugs, as we call experimental agents or investigational drugs. And then FDA approved agents sometimes they are also provided as an investigational status uh, when the drug distributor is uh, from the drug company NCI or SWOG. Uh, in addition to that there are occasions where FDA approved agents can be uh, paid by the subject's insurance. Uh, so we call those commercial distributors. So consequence to that, uh, in the uh, case that we wanted to optimize uh, how we want to present the information. So we currently have three different templates for that. Next slide, please. So first of all, to start with is the non-FDA approved agent. So this is a pretty standardized uh, order of presentation of the information, I like to highlight a few things uh, that will uh, make the difference of uh, this particular template. First of all, for all non-FDA approved agents, you will see a CAPER table which categorize the adverse uh, events uh, based on the frequency. And this is a, a very classic uh, uh, format of the CAPER table. In addition to that, close to the end of the section three, you will also see like the, how the drug is being supplied, storage and stability, and also drug ordering and accountability uh, sections in there. Next slide. So when we get to the FDA approved agents, oftentimes those are the ones that you also in the drug resource, information resource, you will have the package insert as one of your major uh, uh, drug information resource also. In those situations, what we try to do is now go away from including the CAPA table, unless there's a special request. Uh, by the um, uh, study parties. So with that, um, so you can see that the, the uh, topics of this is uh, the adverse event uh, section C will very much look like uh, we would tell you to look at the um, uh, package insert to look for the information. And then in addition to that, because this is from a distributor, uh, designated distributors, so therefore you will still see the um, areas of how the drug is being supplied because sometimes, uh, even though it's an FDA approved agent, but uh, the dose form uh, may be from a investigational supply uh, from the supplier. So you do, uh, we do recommend you to pay attention to that. And in addition to that, there's drug ordering accountability instructions in there. Um, next slide, please. So the last one is when is an FDA approved agent and is basically uh, paid by the uh, subject's uh, insurance, you would see a much shorter uh, drug information section and no caper table, no storage preparation or stability because you can find all those uh, primarily in the approved package insert and no drug ordering or accountability either. Next slide, please. 
So, of course, in the drug information section, there is a subsection with drug interaction, as many of you are well aware that is becoming more and more pertinent, particularly with the increased use of oral agent. Um, so, currently, uh, what we are trying to do is to really um, uh, locate all this complex information uh, accordingly and also to reduce uh, for redundancy. So what the PSC has done is we actually volunteer to take over the drug interaction information in section seven also, which we typically are not involved in composing that section. The reason for that is because we find that there's a lot of sharing of drug interaction information in both section three and section seven. So we decided that we are going to simplify the presentation of the drug interaction in section three by just including one sentence in there, which is what you see on the slide of standardized language being used in section three. So in this, we are just telling you that for the study drug, whether it's a substrate and inhibitors or inducer. Um, so that way is a classification of that and then we refer and say C section seven point something, whatever that A, B, C, D is going to be or one, two, three, four uh, for details. And this is what you should expect to see in section three from here on is a one standardized um, sentence to share with you what to expect. And if you want more detailed information and what to do with the drug interactions, then you go to section seven for that. So the next slide, please. So essentially um, in drugs uh, in section seven, which is a treatment plan, um, what we do is first of all, we have to categorize what kind of drug interaction are we dealing with? So currently there's three major categories. Uh, if it's an enzyme drug interaction, a transported drug interaction, or a QT prolongation. So each one of this type of drug interaction, we have developed standardized language, as well as link uh, to list what the drugs are, uh, the substrates, the inhibitors, or the inducer that are involved in there. And you will, I will show you in that in the next few slides. Furthermore, there are at times very specific drug drug interaction that uh, are of clinical significance. Uh, in those cases, you will see additional information being included in the text of section seven as well. So it's really depending. So what, what is one of the example of that? Uh, recently, we have a, a drug uh, information section that we wrote uh, that there is a significant drug drug interaction with uh, birth control pills. And to me, we feel that that's a very clinical significant uh, drug interaction we must include. So in that, we added um, the specific uh, section in terms of what to do and what to expect with the um, drug interactions as well. So next slide, please. So for example, this is an enzyme drug interaction, uh, standardized language. So you can see that there are three different uh, possibilities. Subst the study drug is a substrate. The study drug is a strong or moderate inhibitors. The study drug is a strong or moderate inducers. So depending on the study drug and which category it fits into, we will, you will, we will select the um, standardized um, uh, sentence. Uh, and then we also will choose the proper link of that, depending on what we are dealing with. So all this link has been pre-approved uh, by NCI, as well as by, and is constantly being monitored by uh, Swag PSC as well. Uh, so this is to get away from listing specific drug in the protocol for the reasons that one is hard to fine sometimes. And second uh, is also because that may change as uh, our knowledge gain. And with that, then we have to go back and revise or update the protocol, another revision. So this is also another reason for doing all this is to decrease uh, the number of times that we have and to uh, that we have to revise the protocol and we're able to maintain updated information in the protocol also. So next slide, please. 
So this has to do with transporters, which is probably less common in use. However, that can occur. Um, so with that, you can see uh, again, the, the structure is quite similar to what I outlined earlier with enzymes. So I'm not going to go into detail because there's a lot of information in here, uh, but that is the structure of how we're going to present the information. Um, next slide, please. And then that last one is QT prolongation. So this is something that uh, we also have. And again, the structure is quite similar. We have a standardized language uh, to be in, inserted into the text of section seven. And also there's a list of the QT prolongation drugs. Next slide, please. So with that, uh, that concludes the section and I'm right at the 10 minute mark. Now I would like to pass that on to Dr. Dan Hurst uh, to share more information on what uh, PSC has been doing for drug interaction also with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sufan <clears throat> and Matt, if you could give me uh, access to controlling the slides, that would be um, helpful. Yeah, give me one second, please. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Let me know. So while we're figuring out the technical issues, I just want to thank Sue Fun for giving me a, a perfect introduction to what I'm talking about. So um Sufan just showed you what we're trying to do, what I see as kind of a temporary solution to give you guys the information that you need so you can screen for drug interactions. But I'm going to show you something that we've been working on for a little while that I think could be a more permanent solution. And I'm hoping that you guys will help me and, and help us help you. So I, I came and spoke to you guys two years ago about what we're doing in our drug drug interaction initiative. So now I'm coming to give you an update and tell you how you can help us take the next step. Um, just trying to pull the controls up. I think you hit the B button. Oh, you have to it out. Uh, Do you know how I advance the slide? So if you click anywhere, you can take control and then you can use your arrow keys to advance the slides. Or the space bar. Okay, sorry about that, everybody. So here's a, a quick outline. I'm just going to give you a little bit of background about drug drug interaction screening, then tell you about the progress that we've made on our uh, DDI screening initiative, and then tell you about the ongoing trial that uh, you all can help out with. So just a quick background: drug drug interactions occur when one drug affects the activity of another drug when they're co-administered. And we generally think about these in two groups, either a pharmacokinetic interaction when one drug affects the amount of the other drug in the body, or a pharmacodynamic drug when one drug affects the body's response to the other drug. So a pharmacokinetic interaction might be something that Sufan was just talking about with a CYP enzyme, whereas a pharmacodynamic interaction could be something like QT prolongation that Sufan also talked about. We know that drug-drug interactions are critical in patients and are even more critical in our study subjects because if you do have a drug interaction, it can increase toxicity of treatment, it can decrease the efficacy of treatment, and it impacts the estimates of the benefit and risk from the SWOG trials. Drug-drug interactions are categorized by severity in several different classifications. So you might see contraindicated or category X or grade five. 
indicating that the drugs should never be co-administered together. Or you might have something like a major interaction or grade four, saying that there's a strong likelihood of harm, or something lower like a moderate or grade three interaction, all the way down to grade one or no interaction. And as you all know, drug interaction screening should be conducted for all subjects enrolling on treatment trials. So we're trying to give you guys tools so you can do this more effectively. We did a survey several years ago now where we asked the uh, head CRAs how often are drug interactions screened in subjects to assess their ability to enroll in SWOG trials. And you can see that at about 50% of sites, drug interactions are only screened when a drug-drug interaction is a specific exclusion criteria, even though almost all protocols have some kind of warnings about co-administering patients due to drug interactions. We then asked who is responsible for drug-drug interaction screening. And although we're from the Pharmaceutical Sciences Committee, it's actually not the pharmacists, it's you guys, it's the ORPs, the research coordinators and the research nurses, the clinical research associates who are doing the drug interaction screening. And we know that you guys come from a diverse set of backgrounds with diverse medical trainings and may or may not be as familiar with the language that we use in uh, drug drug interaction terminology, such as CYP3A4 or inducer or those kinds of things. We then looked at how often do drug drug interactions actually occur in SWOG subjects. So we looked at two trials that collected concomitant medication information in patients who were enrolled. This was about 160 patients, and nearly 30% had one or more major drug-drug interactions. 12% of patients had a drug interaction that actually violated a protocol exclusion criteria, and 7% of patients had what we consider a clinically relevant drug-drug interaction, meaning that we as pharmacists believe that this patient is in real danger of harm. And all of these drug interactions affected the clinical trial agent, again, meaning that this could have uh, affected our estimates of the risks and benefits of the treatment that we're running our clinical trials to understand. So based on this information, we thought that there was a need to create some kind of drug-drug interaction screening tool that could help you guys conduct this in a more efficient and effective manner. So we've been working with a company called PEPID to develop a clinical trial drug-drug interaction screening tool that'll enhance the efficacy, prevent toxicity, and ensure accuracy of clinical trial data. So I'm just gonna flip through really quick what our tool looks like. So if you go to this website, pepid.com backslash swag, and you log in, you will access this tool that you can see on the right-hand side. It's just an empty document. We can make this accessible to all the SWOG ORP, and we've built in specific functionalities that will help for oncology trial drug-drug interaction screening based on our discussions with some of you guys and other ORPs and people at our sites. So when you actually fill in our tool, this is what it looks like. So on the left-hand side here at the top, you can put in what your trial drugs are. So you can see here I put in dibrafenib and trametinib to oral uh, and our cancer agents that have drug drug interaction concerns. On the bottom left, you separately fill in what is the patient's current medication list. You can see here I put in St. John's Wort, I put in on Dancitron, some things with drug drug interaction concerns that someone may not be familiar with. This tool will then allow you to filter the results to show interactions that only impact the study agent or drug interactions that impact. Uh, all the combinations of drugs that you put into the tool. So you would typically, and it defaults to only showing you the drug interactions that affect the study agents. You can then filter these by severity. So you can only look at major or moderate interactions, or you can look at all interactions and you can expand it to see more information as you can see here, where it gives you the mechanism. We know that sometimes your protocols say, uh, a patient who's on, let's say, a CYP2C9 inducer should not be enrolled in this study. So you can check which CYP enzymes or which other um, uh, mechanisms you're concerned about. And then in here in medication characteristics, it'll tell you which of the drugs that you input into the tool are substrates or inhibitors or inducers 
of those uh, enzymes or of those pathways. So it gives you all the information that you need to do the screening for your patient based on their study agent and their current medication list. Then you click create PDF and it gives you, a, a P, it exports a PDF that I'll show you in a second. We have plans for future iterations to add more features that we've heard from, uh, from people on, on your committee, such as automatic import of con concomitant medications from Cerner or Immerse. Here's what the export looks like, the PDF that you can print out and you can put in the patient's um, file. So it shows that you did this screening and then you can take the information that, uh, that is in this and you can forward it to a pharmacist or the study PI and say, are we concerned about this or can we enroll this patient? Okay, we then did a quick pilot of our implementation tool so we gave access to our tool to about 10 different SWAG sites. We identified tool, uh, excuse me, sites that were interested at the spring 2019 symposium. So many of you were possibly there for that. We gave you access to the tool for about three months and then gave you a Qualtrics survey to give us feedback about how useful or usable this scale was and what time, it, how much time it required to screen for drug-drug interactions. So here's a very brief synopsis of those findings. You can see at the top four of our characteristics of usefulness and usability, where there was mostly strongly agreement or agreement that individuals were confident using the tool, they could learn to use it quickly, it was easy to use and they'd like to use it frequently. At the bottom, we had five questions where with negative features, such as it was inconsistent, it was awkward, it was too complex. And you'd see that most of the individuals strongly disagreed or disagreed with these statements. So we had very strong usability and usefulness. We also found that the estimated time to screen drug interactions for a patient decreased from an, an average of 23 minutes to about seven minutes. And we saw that the rates of patients who had drug drug interactions detected, even though that was somewhat high at about 30%, very few patients actually had to be excluded due to drug drug interactions at less than 5%. So we were of course very happy with these preliminary results and we've moved to a prospective trial. And this is where I want your help in helping us conduct this trial. So the objective of this trial is to de determine the benefits of using our PEPID tool to screen for drug interactions in patients enrolling on SWAG trials. We are interested in looking at whether using our tool decreases the prevalence of undetected drug-drug interactions, and secondarily to understand whether we can decrease rates of toxicity and treatment modification. And then we have some other study objectives that I'll just skip in the interest of time. Here's how our study looks. So we are trying to identify at least 10 SWAG sites. There is then a pre-implementation period where you can either retrospectively or prospectively collect drug-drug interaction information for 25 patients enrolled at your site on a SWAG, tr SWAG trial. Once you complete the pre-implementation collection, we then give you access to the PEPID tool, and then you have a post-implementation period where for the next 25 patients or up to the next six months, you can use our PEPID tool and you give us the same information that I'll show you on the next slide. And then, of course, we'll have an end of study user satisfaction survey so we can collect more information about whether this was useful or how we can further improve it. All of the data is collected via Qualtrics, and these surveys are completed after each patient is screened. There is no PHI being collected. So you can see here the list of information that is collected, including your site, the protocol number, the medication list and what drug drug interactions were detected and what the results of that screening were in terms of whether this patient was enrolled or not. Again, our primary endpoint is to see what the proportion of patients who were enrolled at your site prior to and after PEPID who had undetected drug drug interactions with secondary endpoints looking at toxicities and dose adjustments, how many patients failed screening due to drug drug interactions and looking at the appropriateness and the time required to screen patients. So again, I really need all of your help. I thank everybody who helped with the pilot. If you or your site are at all interested in participating, please email me or put your contact information in the chat 
or send an email to the new ORP email address, any way to get in contact with us and let us know that you might be interested in participating. This study does not require a site PI, it does not require an MD. This is all being done with the ORPs and with you guys. It does not require IRB approval. We have some data use agreements. We have actually done this with some sites and it does not require a lot of time to get you guys up and running. This is all done with the ORP staff and Qualtrics surveys and we work directly with you guys. And we really need your help and we're really excited about this tool. So in summary, we know that there's a high prevalence of drug interactions in oncology patients enrolling on SWOG trials. And we know that there's a critical need to give you guys a tool that you can use to help with drug drug interaction screening. We have created a tool that has high usability and usefulness that decreases the time required to screen patients and leads to low rates of trial exclusions. What we need now are sites that are willing to help out with our phase two study. Please contact me if you are at all willing to help out. We greatly appreciate your continued participation and feedback. I want to especially highlight those sites that participated in our pilot study and especially the, so the two sites bolded at the top, OHSU and Gibbs, who have actually been doing our prospective phase two implementation pilot and helping us work out all the kinks so everything is ready for the rest of you guys to jump on and get started right away. Thank you so much for your participation. Okay, we are switching gears and um, I would like my slides to be advanced, please. And so I'm, oh, not yet, not yet. Um, so uh, I'm Rivka Steiger. I'm from the University of Michigan and uh, I will present a patient education handout for study participants that are taking investigational drugs and actually investigational oral chemotherapy. This general handout was developed by pharmacists in consultation with others. Three of us are members of the SWOG Pharmaceutical Sciences Committee, and one, Linda, used to be part of PSC and is now with industry. And the rationale for the development of the handout and the handout itself are published in the American Journal of Health System Pharmacists and the citation is listed on this slide. Next slide, please. So why is the handout needed? Um, so guidelines and best practices published between 2013 and 2015 by national organizations list items that should be included in patient counseling sessions and patient education material. These guidelines indicate that information need to be provided to patients in a written form and in an appropriate reading level. References to these guidelines are provided in the article. In 2014 and 2015, I led a project where SWOG Pharmaceutical Sciences Committee worked with SWOG Patient Advocate Committee and ORP on including a drug-specific patient information handout in SWOG protocols. Some of you may remember this project and probably helped with it. But there were concerns about resources and upkeep, and the initiative did not move forward. Realizing the need for a handout, I, with few research pharmacists that worked on the project, on the project or other patient education initiatives, decided to publish a general patient education handout. And this is what I'm going to present to you today. Next slide, please. So when you think on information that is provided to study patients, um, the information is usually provided verbally and uh, what is presented in a written form is in the informed consent. So usually information on drug administration and storage is provided verbally when the first time the drug is given to the patients to take home. Information that is included in the informed consent is contact information, study design, treatment plan, information on tests and procedures, 
a list of adverse effects and sometimes information on drug interactions. But information that is usually missing is detailed product administration information, storage disposition, adverse effect reporting, and safe handling. So this handout that we developed was designed to bridge the gap. And um, so we think that this handout can be used as written information to guide the patient counseling, as written information that participants can take home, or it can be used during future clinical visit, clinic visits uh, as a reminder. Next slide, please. And the principles that guided the development of the handout was a, a use of plain language principles. We followed guidelines that are listed in the Centers of Medicare and Medicaid Services Toolkits for making written material clear and effective. So we used active form, we used large font size, we made sure that there's a lot of white space. We tried to limit the length, but this was difficult because we had a lot to say. And we consulted with the University of Michigan patient education librarian. Next slide, please. So what information is included? So in the next two slides, I'll present to you the handout itself. Next slide, please. It's a very small print, but do not worry because this is posted for you on the Pharmaceutical Sciences website. Um, so in terms of what type of information we chose to include is we started with general information on what is a study drug. And we had a place to list the drug name and the study number. And then we continued in a question and answer format. So we started with what do I need to know about being in a clinical study? And here we talked about commercial drugs that are used in a study off label. We talked about control groups and placebo. Uh, in the section about how to take the study medication, we went over issues like what to do when one cannot swallow the drug, uh, what if a dose is missed, what if it's vomited, and what to do if there's a drug log provided for the study. In the section on how to store the medication, we reminded subject, they, they should not transfer the drug to a pill box, that they need to check the label for storage and not to store the drug in a car or what to do when traveling. Next, next slide, please. In the section about tips for study participants, we discuss bringing drug bottles back to the clinic and not discarding the study drug at home. And we reminded participants to let the study know, a team know if they start or stop a medication if there's a potential drug interactions in the study. And we also have a section on how to handle a medication that is considered hazardous. And we have some links to information about a clinic on, on information on clinical trials. We have a space to lead to list um, the study team contact information. And uh, at the bottom, we have a disclaimer reminding everybody that the handout is supplemented to verbal communication with the study team. And we also list the, the citation to the article. Next slide, please. So how the handout should be used. So it should be used during consultation and because it has much more information that one needs for each and every study, it should be personalized during the consultation by writing on the form, by highlighting things. Uh, it can also be used when drug is dispensed to the patient by the pharmacy. During COVID-19, we started to ship drugs to patients. So this handout can be placed in the box with the shipment. And if the institution has a patient education resource centers, that's a good place to have this handout. 
Um, next slide, please. So documents that are provided to study participants need to be approved by the IRB. And at the University of Michigan, I wanted this handout to be used uh, generally and that um, the study team won't have to obtain IRB approval for each specific study. So I sent it to our IRB and asked for feedback and asked how can we have this as a general resource to be downloaded with study teams and used. So our IRB asked that I will remove the spot for the study drug name and the study number. And then I was allowed to post it uh, on our patient education clearing house. And now it can be used uh, as a general form. Um, when we wrote the article, we approached the NCI Central IRB and asked if we can get an approval for this document to be used in SWOG studies. And we were told that Central IRB, unfortunately, does not approve general documents. It only approves them when they are part of the study. Next slide, please. So here is what we did at University of Michigan. We put our logo, we removed the information that IRB asked us to remove. There's more pages here that I cut, but the last page include the disclaimer and include a reference to the article from where this handout was coming from. Next slide, please. So what is the next step? So as I said, um, this handout is now posted on the Pharmaceutical Sciences website, uh, this work Pharmaceutical Sciences website. So each and every one of you can download it, can change it, can, can, can adapt it to your institution, send it to your IRB. Different IRBs may have different um, guidelines and um, may allow different things but uh, it's you're welcome to use it just make sure that you include a citation to the article in the disclaimer and i also heard that uh, and understand that there is going to be a pilot to use this handout as a template for a patient education handout in a swap protocol so um my email Contact information is on this slide, and I will be happy to answer any question that will come either from the ORP web uh, email or directly to me. Thank you. Next, I think, is uh, Jen Rogers. Yes, thank you. Um, if you could advance my slides to my slides. I know that we're running a little bit short on time. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak on a initiative that the gastrointestinal committee is doing. Um, and I'm the GI pharmacy liaison from the pharmaceutical sciences committee working on the gastrointestinal committee. And with that, we are um, beginning an initiative on electronic health record order sets um, and trying to figure out ways to standardize that. Um, if you could advance my slide. So um, to start off, um, an innovative multidisciplinary working group was created by Dr. Kathy Ng, who's the vice chair of the GI committee. This was done around April 2020, and the real reason kind of behind this innovative working group was because of the COVID uh, pandemic. We wanted to kind of, um, you know, discuss certain ways that we could help our patients through innovative ways of clinical trials. One of the concepts uh, was uh, to standardize clinical trial electronic health record order sets. And I direct you to the article cited there for more initiatives that the committee will begin working on pretty soon. Uh, next slide. So um, as we all know, a multi-institutional clinical trial protocol contains intricate and robust details. There's no standard approach uh, of converting the clinical trial protocol um, details into a practical real-world implementation. Most oncology settings and centers use EHR order sets. Um, they're a very common practice now. They include many components, and particularly when you're talking about a clinical trial, they can be very complex. 
and require vigorous validation process in which many bottleneck delays can occur. So with hope of a standard treatment template, this would reduce potential bottleneck delays, enhance uniformity of care, help patient safety, and reduce activation times. Next slide. So for our um, initiative, uh, we wanted to implement order set examples for new clinical trials, each arm of those clinical trials via the GI, sub, uh, GI committee for SWAB. The primary developer of the order sets is uh, myself, which is the GI committee pharmacy liaison. And then after that development, it's reviewed with the principal investigator who will uh, need to sign off on it. The goals of the initiative, again, are to improve patient safety, safety, reduce validation times, activation times, and reduce ambiguity resulting in less questions to the principal investigators. Next slide. In April 2020, um, we presented this to the Pharmaceutical Sciences Committee um, because uh, if this concept is successful in the GI Committee, we hope to expand it to other committees as well. And the uh, Pharmaceutical Sciences Committee will be key in that um, strategy as well. Next. So to start off with this initiative, we wanted to compare across different sites of what a current trial looked like to see what differences we have amongst our EHR order sets. This was both involving Cerner and Epic. It, this study was a GI protocol. It was a two-arm study consisting of gemcitabine, cisplatin, and paclitaxel as uh, one of the investigational arms and gemcitabine, cisplatin as the second arm. And there were minor differences observed, but nothing too um, uh, inhibitory to, to move forward with our concept. Next slide. So we, as a multidisciplinary group of that innovative working group, sat down and discussed what components we feel like uh, is needed in a order set example in order to help institutions create their EHR order set um, in a timely fashion. So next slide. This, these were components that we um, are trying to answer in these word examples that are um, developed based on the protocol. So it's a general overview um, of cycle specifics. Are there supportive care prescriptions needed, growth factor support while commenting on the use of biosimilars, hydration uh, requirements, any line requirements, chemotherapy sequencing, so what order do the drugs need to go in, um, if there's any weight changes uh, specified by the protocol, the drug supply, um, oral chemotherapy prescription guidance if, if applicable. And then there's additional um, guidelines in the Word document for per cycle per day, commenting on take-home chemotherapy treatment parameters, labs, research pharmaceutical studies, vital signs, pre-medications, the investigational drug specifics, hypersensitivity, if any information there, um, any PRN medication and discharge instructions. Next slide. So as of now, we've started with one clinical trial, um, and that was our pilot. Um, and I think we learned some, some things about that uh, that will hopefully help us streamline the process a little bit more. And we have a new trial starting soon that we'll be developing um, another order set example for. And then we're also planning to um, provide a survey uh, to physicians to see if they use the order set examples and what feedback they have. And next slide, I think that's it. Okay, then I wanna thank everybody. I wanna thank um, all of our panelists um, for your expertise and sharing your information with us today. I would like everyone to know, um, our attendees, that the slides will be available on the SWAB website at the end of the meeting. If you have any questions about anything that happened, any questions that from the speakers, please go ahead and email them directly, or you can email us at ORP at swag.org and we will get it to our speakers. Again, I wanna thank all the pharmaceutical scientists for their expertise, and we hope that everyone has a good rest of your, uh, your SWAG meeting. Thanks very much, everybody.